I wanted to ask how, how many people have seen me give a talk anywhere, online, something, something. All right, I need to make up new jokes then. Uh, <laughs> and how many people have seen a lock-free talk of mine? Well, that's, that's sad too, because uh, I'll, I'll run through the, the, the uh, review. Let's see a couple more people coming, but I'll start. Um, I work for Christy. We take a bunch of projectors and shine them on something, and then we align it and blend it so it looks like one, one image. I mean, Christy makes projectors. The part I work on is projection mapping. Uh, we do uh, flight simulators. We do theaters. That theater is uh, this sits on a desk. Those are those are Lego people. <laughs> <laughs> but there's two projectors shining on that on that thing. And because they're not our projectors, th these are little tiny projectors. You can actually see the that side is not the same. See that there's a line of just up there. It's because it's not blended right because the project the little projectors don't have proper gamma. So our projectors have uh, correct gamma. Uh, there's a real uh, system. I don't know how many. There's probably like six, four to six projectors shining on that wall. Uh, we do uh, sports installations because because you know because we're Canadian, we have to show <laughs> hockey. Uh, we do buildings. That's uh, Canada uh, capital. Parliament. That's uh, Moscow. That's a really good video on YouTube because it all lights up and changes colors and does cool stuff. That's a gray car. That's the other. That's the same gray car. See how the if you don't have light shining on it, it's a dark gray. Even the, the we also do the panels at the back. So there's a little display up there, and the car's like this big. You can make it whatever color you want, change the color of the wheels, change the style of the wheels, whatever you want to do. Even the little brake calipers in there are just sh shining on the on the car. And that's how we do it. And that's where I work. And this has no, that has nothing to do with lock-free programming. And uh, I <coughs> avoid writing lock-free programming at work because it's a dangerous thing to do. And that's that's uh, that's uh, part of my talk is to convince you not to do lock-free programming. Um, many of you have seen this before. If you've seen me give a talk before, if you're writing any kind of threaded coding, you should, uh, you know, in kindergarten you learn to share with your friends. Don't share data when you're doing uh, threaded coding. Um, all your problems go away. That's it's that simple. Just don't share data. Make a copy of the data. Work work on a copy. Um, if you have to share data, just use locks. And then uh, measure and measure again. And if it's too slow, change your algorithm. Go to one. Uh, and you'll see that lock-free is what you do at infinity. It, it is a algorithm that never ends. You never get to lock-free. Lock-free is the last thing you want to do. Um, and if you do lock-free program, you know, uh, forget there. After you've done the lock-free, you have to measure again because it's not necessarily any faster. There's there's been there's papers out there showing that some some cases and some algorithms this cannot be faster. Made you know when you make it lock-free. Um, so don't share and use locks. That's that's the guide to threaded coding. My uh, rules with lock-free coding are th are thus: don't talk about lock-free coding. That's that's it. Yep. End of talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, uh, uh, guide to coding in general. Macros are evil. That has nothing to do with my talk either. But I've got a <laughs> audience that is you know a captive audience. So there you go. I think it'd be much better if they were always typeset in Comic Sans. Yes, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly why it's in Comic Sans. It's, it's to really remind you that that would be, that, that would be a nice uh, IDE extension. All macros are done in, in Comic Sans and, and, and bigger. Just be like, oh, God. Somebody has to look at extension for that. Yeah. Uh, w you know, to fit stuff on slides, I might use short forms like acquire and release and CAS. I always say CAS in my head because it used to be called compare and set or compare and swap. Now it's called compare exchange. Um, and in general, you know, my coding style is not like cram as much code into into one you know one line of code, but it's it's slide plus plus. I think Jens is the one who calls it that all the time. <laughs> uh, so almost lost Marshall there. Uh, that would be embarrassing. Yeah, <laughs> we'll move the camera so we can get it on film. Um, 
So we're going to write this uh, multi-producer, multi-consumer queue. So multiple threads can push to the queue, multiple threads can uh, pull from the queue. And you'll notice that the shape of this queue is uh, what I like to call a bottleneck. Because like I said, why are you sharing data? Why do you have all your data going through one queue and have all your threads hammer on the same queue? It would be probably better to have multiple threads in multiple queues. But when you get this, you might want, you know, if you have this thread is always using this queue, what happens is the same thing that happens at work is that this guy has nothing to do and this guy's doing all the work. So you need to do work sharing sometimes. So we're going to basically concentrate on one queue out of uh, that you could maybe use to build a work sharing uh, set of queues. So that's our queue. And like most queues, it has a head and a tail. And uh, what's it going to look like inside? Well, we're going to use a buffer. And uh, it's a circular buffer, so we'll have times when the head is over here and the tail is on the other side. So you have to keep that in mind, right? But that's basically it. There's a buffer, a head, and a tail. And uh, for now, we're going to make a compromise and say the only thing we can store is integers. Because, you know, what else do you ever need? Integers, integers is the best thing ever, right? Um, really, it's because integers are atomic. I can, well, if I put the word atomic around them, I can make them atomic. Um, and th this queue, if you remember from any other time I've given this talk, uh, or the pre you know, this is part three of N, so you know, if you've watched any of the other ones, um, we have this really weird head and tail where it's head-ish and tail-ish, because um, the head and tail won't necessarily point to the right spot. It'll point hopefully somewhere close to the right spot, but doesn't have to be the right spot. Um, so I like using ish. Um, when the committee came up with standard experimental, the next day, because I missed, I wasn't in the room that day, the next day I said, we should have called it standard colon colon ish. <laughs> that's <laughs> kind of, you know, <laughs> it's almost standard. Um, I, I should have pushed for that. I just let it go. I was gonna, was, had, the, had the chance and missed it. Um, so tail starts here and it looks for the first non-data found is the real tail. And head, wherever it is, looks for the first real data. So um, we've got, so far all we know is that X is our data and blanks are our non-data. So we need something to mark what non-data is. And we're going to say data, data equal equals zero is, is non-data, right? X is our data, zeros are non-data. Great. So that means the integers you put in here can't be zero. Sorry, I've taken that away from you. You can't have zero integers. Who needs zero anyway? Um, so the, the tail will move along looking for a zero, and then we move along one more, and what does the queue look like at this point, right? It just looked like that, and now it looks like we have no idea, because that's, that's lock reprogramming. You have no idea what the next state is. <laughs> and not only that, you have no idea, you can only see one state. You can only look at one thing at a time, the rest is always blank to you. So we look at this next state, and we go, hey, great, it's a zero, that's what I was looking for, that's what I was hoping for. I probably have this case. Great, I found the tail. Or that zero was this, and actually the queue looked like that. So I didn't find the tail. All I saw was a zero here, and I don't know what the rest looks like. So I can't just use zero as my marker for, you know, because the queue might have moved past me, and now I'm looking, I'm looking for this, but I found this one first. So of course, that's not good. Let's put ones there, right? So now I know that that's not zero, so I know it's, it's not data, but it's also not the zero I'm looking for. And eventually, of course, um, now, now this is good, you know, we'll find, we'll, we'll man manage to make our way over to here, the first zero. But this is a circular buffer, so eventually this will get filled up. That'll, it'll start filling up over there, and eventually we'll come over to here, and the queue is moving <coughs> along. And now I've got ones and ones, I'm, I need to look for the first one, not the first zero anymore. So obviously I'll make those twos, right? And then eventually I'm going to make them fours and fives and we'll keep going up, right? So now I've stolen uh, half your integers. You can have all the negative integers or you can imagine that red means negative and you can have all the positive integers. I don't want to be a sinist of any kind. You <laughs> pick, pick which one you like the best. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, I've taken half your numbers, but I've only taken one bit. Okay, so it's not that bad. You have lots of numbers to use. Um, and now we can, uh, as long as we keep track of this generation, we know 
what generation we're, we're on. Like Tail has to know that we're on generation four. We're not looking for generation five. We'll never get confused of finding five. We'll just find the first four. Um, and that's how tail works. Now we're talking about head. Head basically has a similar problem of it's going to look for, you know, just to be careful here that this is, head is way behind, the real head is over here, the real tail is here. We have the same problem that head's looking for um, data, not, not, not the non-data, but it's got data here, that's not the data it's looking for. These are not the droids that you're looking for. Um, this is the data that we're looking for. So, you know, that would be the wrong, the wrong first data. Obviously, we're ne going to need to put a generation count on, on the data as well, so that we find the data of the correct generation. Um, and similarly, that's going to increment forever. And now I've, uh, I'm not going to try to take like another half of your integers away to make to make this data. I'm just going to make a, an entry in the buffer now. I've got two integers in my buffer. And basically I'm gonna say um, that, that, well, we'll see later that I'm gonna say that two integers can be lock free. Use small integers, use a big machine, whatever, 64 bit lock free, 96 bit lock free sometimes. Um, but still data can't be zero because I still need zeros uh, as a marker of non-data and then of the right generation, so. I still taken away zero from you, <coughs> but um, I've now given you back uh, your other half of uh, you've given you all your integers back except zero. You can you can have your negative integers back. So now tail is looking for the first uh, data of the correct generation, and head is looking for the first data, non-data of the correct generation. So, um, and that's that's what it's looking for. And we can just run through a quick example. Um, you'll notice that if the these start getting eaten away, which is what Pac-Man does, he pop, pops things off the queue. We get to this case where we've only got one item left on the queue and we're looking for it. And uh, you know, if you imagine what the algorithm is, because I haven't shown you the algorithm, but I've kind of explained it, that we're just looking for the first X of the right generation. We know we're looking for that. Um, we will find it, no problem, great. Um, but then we get to this case where that one got popped off and now we have an empty queue. So if we look for the first data x4, we're not going to find it and we will just spin around, wrap around looking for the queue, right? Yeah, just walk, 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 walk all the way, all the way across. Um, which in some sense uh, wouldn't be, it'd be bad, but it would actually be correct because eventually someone will put something in the queue and then you'll stop. But, you know, it's kind of like, oh, let's, it's, it's kind of like a really bad spin lock because it's not even just spinning on one memory location. It's spinning on cross, you know, loading a whole pile of memory locations. It's really, really bad. Technically correct. Yep. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, you're right. My next slide just threw up this queue is empty word. Um, you can see it's empty because it's got all zeros. The hard part is to figure out where where's the beginning and end. And you can only tell by that, that change of, of generation. And we get the same interesting problem. So if you ignore generation count for a, while, for a minute, you can see just by data and non-data where uh, this is the, the, the next data goes here. So the tail is pointing here and the uh, first data to pop is there. You can see just by looking at the data. But as soon as the queue is full, now you can't see just by looking at the, at the zeros and ones uh, where, where the beginning and end is. So again, we need the generation count to show me this change of generation means that we're on the edge of the queue. So if we look at this case, um, Pinky, you gotta know your, your ghost names. Pink, Pinky, Inky, Blinky, and Clyde. Uh, Pinky is the one who's pushing items and Pac-Man is popping items. Uh, Pinky's on generation four, looking for that spot, and he can find it. Um, it's actually, so he's looking for uh, a zero four, right? So he'll actually run along here, looking for zero four, and not find it. And he'll wrap around, so he'll increment generation count. 
because now we're on fifth generation and he'll keep looking for it. And what we need to do is not keep going around forever and increment. It's, it's another case where if we didn't, if we just kept looking for a zero of the right generation, we'll, we'll again keep going forever, but this time we'll go forever until the generation count wraps around four billion and then gets back to like, oh, zero five, there's finally one here. It should be much worse. Um, so instead we'll have to look for, hey, the current generation, the generation in the buffer is less than the generation I'm looking for. I must be at the end, right? But notice now that Pinky is looking for generation five and Pac-Man is still looking for generation four because he's looking for the, the front of the thing and he hasn't wrapped around yet. So that generation count needs to be two separate generation counts, one for head, one for tail. They're completely separate. So in fact, let's just put that in a struct called Jenny, for lack of a better name, integer plus generation. Um, and the nice part about that is we could like put a plus plus operator and whatever else we need to do inside of that struct. Um, this is not a complete list of things, but we can like, is it data? We can check for a thing. Is it zero? Is it like really means zero of the correct generation? Um, and, and, you know, it actually makes the code look nicer to put those things together. And now we can make it atomic, as I kind of was implying. It's very simple. You throw the word atomic at it. Just isn't that how you solve all <laughs> atomic problems? Just throw atomic on it. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm just going to claim that entry is small enough to be atomic. If it's not small enough, use smaller. If you're on a really small platform that's <coughs> got, you know, 8-bit is all you can atomically swap or something like that, well, then I bet your queues don't need to be that big either, right? So everything kind of scales down with, with the system. Um, and the generation count, I'm going to not make them atomic, but I'm going to make them laxtomic. So what the heck is laxtomic, right? So if anyone ever saw Herb's talk on uh, atomic weapons of mass destruction, it's actually just called atomic weapons, but <laughs> the right name is of mass destruction. Uh, he said, like, never, ever do relaxed atomics. That is just a bad thing to do. Just stick with sequential consistency. That's hard enough. Don't do relaxed atomics. So this lax atomic structure is exactly the same as atomic, except for I've made every operation default to relaxed. It's like we're go, go, go all in on relaxed atomics. And now the question is, why in the world do you think that's a, an okay thing to do, right? Is that okay? So normal lock-free code does things like this. You set some data, you set X and Y, you mark it as ready, and you either just say ready equals true, and you get a full uh, sequential consistent, or at least do a release here and then on the other side, you do an acquire saying, hey, is the data ready? And if it is ready, then I can read it, right? <coughs> and if you go open up the holy standard, you will find uh, the happens before and sequence happens before and all these terminology that says, yes, the fact that you see this acquire sees the data that was written by this store with a release means that these things happened before this because that's like normal program order and these things happened after that. So we have an ordering between, between them all. Uh, and in particularly, this x, this x equals 10 can't float down to here. You know, these two could still swap around because no one really cares what order you wrote these in. Basically, if y was for some reason before x in your data structure, they probably would, you know, in memory, would probably get written in a different order. But as soon as you mark this thing as a, as a kind of a barrier, this, this will never happen. Things down here, if you have like, you know, z equals 12, that can float above, but <coughs> things up here can't float down. And the opposite is this can't float up to here. It has to come after. So instead of looking at um, all these fancy terms that happens before, a released uh, memory order means before means before. The code you saw before happens before the <coughs> release. And acquire means after means after, which is what you like to think programming always does. But if your computer actually always did everything in order, it would be about 100 times slower than it is. So computers in a single, th a, a computer assumes that you are running in a single thread and it does everything it can to make that single thread fast. And 
which is really weird because the computer knows that there's another processor sitting right beside it and that it's not single threaded, but we all know that most of the code would really uh, appreciate acting as if single threaded and being 100 times faster. So we force the programmer to mark the places where, no, I really, order is important here. So that's normal lock free code, if normal lock free code is a thing at all. And now relaxed uh, lock free code means that you know you set this store and it has no ordering relationship with the things around it so this can float afterwards and this can happen before the relaxed and you'll probably be pretty sad if you do stuff like that and you were expecting this ready flag to actually say something about the data that it's related to and that is the important part about uh, lock free and require release is that there's a relationship between you're, you're claiming a relationship between this data and this data right this you're saying hey that these things are important and they go together and make sure uh, that they go together and, and they're they stay consistent so when you use relaxed you're saying no there's no there's no interrelationship between the data right you're saying you basically with relax you're saying oh that x equals 10 has nothing to do with the ready flag why would you do that so now here's the question. What other data relies on head-ish and tail-ish? And my claim is nothing. Head and tail are just hints as to <coughs> what's really going on in the queue. The real information is in the queue. You can look at the queue, not that you can look at, you know, as a programmer, as a program, you can't look at the whole queue at once, but you know, I've got this nice picture on the wall, and you can look at the queue and know where head and tail are without looking at head and tail. You can just look at the data. So head and tail don't need to be uh, anything more than relaxed because no other data relies on them. They're just hints, right? So that's our queue. That's, that's all there is to the data structure at least. And so let's throw some code at this, right? So what does push do? It kind of ex describes push already. Oh, and even though I've got like, uh, one diagram always on the, like, this is just be burned into your eyeballs, right? This diagram is on every slide. Um, you should actually always keep in mind, like, every, a whole variety of states of, you know, what's a full queue look like? A full queue with two uh, generations in it, a full queue with one generation, empty queues, queues <coughs> that are partially wrapped around are just on the edge. You know, this one is like, the data is only here, but the, the uh, tail is on the other end. Those are all the cues that we have to imagine exist inside this data structure. And again, we can only see one piece of that at a time. So keep that in mind. So nonetheless, I will show you a diagram as if we could see the whole thing. And it's a beautiful false sense of security. <laughs> so it's a very simple algorithm. As I mentioned, we go, we're going to find the tail and then write a value there, right? That's all there is to it. Except what happens between we found the tail, you know, it was right here, we found it. But then the whole world can change on that next line of code. So if we go to write the value here, we don't know that it's still, we could have this. Clyde could have came in and, you know, you had to know your names. Clyde could have come in and set data there. So when we go to write value, we got to take a look before we write a value and see that someone else has already been there. And of course, it's the same, you know, we just looked at it. <coughs> why, why are we looking at it again? But we have to look at it and set it at the same time. And that's compare exchange. So we're going to have to try to write the value. <coughs> and if we can't write the value, we go back up and we just try to find the, the, find the, uh, the tail again. Um, but small little thing there. Why do we start back here looking for the tail? We might as well, oh right before we get to that. This is an interesting part of lock free. We fail because someone else showed up, right? You only fail when someone else makes progress. This looks like a, like a, this looks like a loop. It could look like a spin lock. Just say, oh, I'm just looping and, and why, how is this lock free if I'm looping because someone else did something? But you only fail only when someone else uh, does something. Where, whereas, uh, so a CAS loop, which is what, you know, there, there's a CAS, a compare exchange inside of here somewhere, hiding in, in here. 
a CAS loop fails on, 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 will loop around on progress. A spin lock will loop around if there's progress or if there's no progress because the other thread has just stopped for a while and taken a break. But you know, you're spinning on a flag waiting for the other thread to be done. So that's not lock free because you're spinning when you're making no progress if the other guy doesn't make progress. Here, you only, someone made progress. You can guarantee someone made progress. That's, that's the nature of lock free. Somebody made some, made some progress. Um, but yeah, the other thing I was going to mention is that we don't want to start, if this fails, we don't want to start over to here. We just want to start from where we were. So we only read tailish once, and it's a nice, it's only one relaxed uh, atomic load. And then, uh, and then we can just keep going with pause. Um, pause isn't even, uh, isn't even atomic. It's just a, it's, I, I, I uh, if you put auto here, then suddenly pause is atomic. So you got to be careful of that. So, fine tail. As I mentioned, fine tail goes along looking for a zero. And while it's not zero, uh, increment. And we assume our increment is, is magic and smart enough such that when it gets to the, the size of the queue, it'll increment the, the generation count. And zero is a zero of the right generation. Right? And notice that we do a relaxed load on the buffer here. So we're still doing more relaxed, even though I said the buffer has the real data and that's where we're going to need to use stronger uh, memory orders. Right now, we're just going to uh, do a relaxed load, which means as you search through this thing looking for the tail, that's about as fast as non-atomic because relaxed loads are basically the same as non-atomic on most, on most architectures because um, ints are already atomic, right? Um, so you're basically just look going through a buffer. So that's, this, is, this should be pretty fast. Um, but as mentioned, when the queue is full, this is not going to be the right thing and we'll just spin around forever. So instead, uh, we looked for this change and we'll put in, well, if it's not zero, what about the generation? Is the generation uh, <coughs> lower than what, I, what I'm looking than what I'm looking for here? And you can feel free to try to rearrange this in various forms. You know, if it's zero, if we're either looking at equal generation or if it's not zero, you know, same th same thing. I think you could even shorten that with some, you know, ands and ors or something. Who knows? X or. Like hmm. Honey test the compiler. The compiler will do it. Yeah, that's true. Yes, exactly. That is. Thank you. The compiler will make this the right short form. The only reason this works out to be slightly nicer is because when I do head, then I only have to change one thing instead of changing two things. But. Um, so that is basically, uh, so that will find the, the tail. Now, there's, and, and uh, you know, important to note that when pause gets to here, it increments the generation count inside of that. I already mentioned it, and therefore this will happen and we'll find the right spot. Um, this does mean that find tail will return a tail that you can't write to. So somewhere in here, we should probably add, uh, hey, if it's full, do something. Um, uh, but also, uh, I should mention, is tail. It, just looking at this function on its own, is this the tail, right? This function would say, yes, that's the tail. It's not the tail. We know it's not the tail because in find tail, um, so instead, we should name it maybe tail because the thing is, it's we only know if it's a tail because find tail has a precondition that we start somewhere before the tail and we go and we move forward. If we were just start anywhere in the middle of the queue, this is not going to tell you whether it's the tail or not. It only works because we start somewhere that we know from previous times or whatever, or because we started at zero at the beginning, generation zero. We could just always jump in here with this being zero zero, and loop five times until you find the tail. But we'd probably rather not do that. That's why we have a hint. Um, but we, get, we have a precondition that our hint always starts on or before the tail. Um, but to name things properly, this thing in isolation only tells you if it maybe is tail, and this precondition tells you that it is tail. 
So, you know, come to my talk tomorrow, which is more about how to, how to write better code. Um, so exercise for the reader, I'm not putting in here, but uh, do something on full. Either return false, saying that you, you can't push because it's full, or a tricky thing to do is to wait for it to be non-full, actu actually using a convar, you know. But then it's like convars, that requires locks. How do you, you still want to be lock-free. You want to be lock-free except for when it's full or when it's empty. So, you know, some tricky stuff there. That's why it's an exercise for the reader. Um, and actually, that, that full thing is, is based on this, right? This, t this tells you the difference between it really, it's an empty tail, it's a full tail. So you need to get that full data somehow from this. This answer has to bubble back up to here maybe and you know, make, pass it in as a, as a reference. And then, or, it's, which I find really interesting, is the last time I wrote this, push had all the code in it. It was you know, a big pile of code and it was all kind of inlined. Um, and then full kind of just works itself out. But I really like the structure of this better. Full makes it a little more complicated, therefore I'm just ignoring it. So there, there is us ignoring. So try write um, is very simple. We have, to, we have to keep in mind that Clyde might have, this thing that was zero, Clyde might have come in and, and messed it up for us. So we're gonna need a compare exchange. And basically, we know what the old one looked like. We could have saved, like we read somewhere inside of pause tail, we read, we read this entry, but um, we assume it was zero. So we can re 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 recreate the old entry. Um, Back when I wrote C code, uh, I would use the word new here, in, right? <laughs> and it was just very natural to use new. Now I'm like, ah, uh, so this is how I spell new, I guess. Um, I was, is N-I-W, N-U-W, I don't know, like N-I-E-W, like view, new. Uh, but I, I kind of wanted it to be, yeah, maybe an E on the end, because I want it to be three letters, right? Has to match the old and new. Um, Having, having parallel things look parallel in your code is a good feature, right? Um, so having things of the same number of letters. Uh, by the way, everyone knows that all the memory orders have exactly the same number of letters. Release, relaxed, uh, uh, sec con const for sequential consistency. So if you make a new one, like there's, there's the uh, uh, memory order happens to work. So happens is also the right number of letters. Um, it's a, it's, you shouldn't use that one. Um, so we say if it uh, still is a zero, then replace it with the new value, which is our value that we're trying to push into the queue, put the new value in there. And now we say we need a release thing. Um, and this, this one is if it fails, uh, we don't need any, we just relax. So when it fails, uh, it will give you the right, it will tell you what's in old. Old will get updated with like the C from Clyde or whatever if this fails. And then you can actually have a, what kind of memory ordering do you need on that, that read. We don't really care because we just throw old away anyhow. Um, so we can, we're fine with relax if it fails. Um, now why do we need a release here? What data, what, what, what data is all this dependent on? And in, in I think for our queue, there's no real data that this depends on. And it it's depends on what you're doing with the numbers. If these numbers are indices into a vector that has data in it, then you have a dependency on these numbers and that data. So I'm going to assume that these, this data that you're pushing in here is important for something. Therefore, I'm putting a release on here for your sake, for the outside user. If this was just like a buffer of uh, input input keystrokes, they have no extra data to them. They're just a keystroke on its own and they don't refer to any other data. Then you could probably get away with relaxed here because it's just the data and no ex nothing, nothing else related to it. But you also have to imagine that we are communicating to <coughs> our, we're, we're communicating to, to head and the, the other half. Um, so we might need a, you know, this is exercise for a reader. Do we need a release here even for our own internal code? Uh, so that's push in, in broken up into four functions instead of crammed into all one function. 
Hopefully that works. Um, and then there's one other thing we might want to do once we get to here. Anyone have any idea what we, what we forgot to do? No, the yes, yes. Update tailish. Exactly the word. He used the right <laughs> words. Update tailish with the, the pause we found. So it's interesting, though, because the pause we found and we just wrote to might not be the right tail anymore because someone else might have written right after us. So, and, you know, uh, by the way, also it's update with the next pause, right? Because we wrote here, so we want to mark the, the next possible tail is here. That's what, so there's a plus plus there. So when we call update tailish, again, we have no idea what the queue looks like, and we actually have no idea what tail looks like, tailish looks like, right? Hopefully it's not actually over here. <laughs> it's somewhere in this range, but we don't know what it looks like. So one way we could uh, update this is to compare exchange, right? And say, well, if somewhere we would have to, like, when we up here, we would have to remember where we started, and make, make have a variable old tailish. It's like we started searching here, we ended up there, we wrote to we wrote to this spot, and here's where we think it is. And we say, if no one else has changed tail, then we're going to update it, right? And this, because tailish is a uh, lax atomic, this is relaxed in theory. Um, but a compare exchange has to read and write, and no one does a relaxed compare exchange. It's, it's, a, it's going to be a heavier than relaxed, um, just the way the hardware works. It's going to put a lock on the cache and whatnot. Um, so another thing we can consider is, even if tail has changed by someone else, we might still be ahead of it, because we're kind of interleaving with someone else who's, who's pushing. We pushed here. Um, they, they may have pushed here, they updated. We started with tailish over here. While we were looking, they updated tailish to be here. We kept going, we, we got to this spot. So we're ahead, but tail has changed. So we can actually do that by say, you know, what is the most recent tailish that we know? And if that's less than where we are, then we can try to do uh, the compare exchange. And we can keep looping on that as long as we're ahead. Because as we're doing this compare exchange, it might still be moving forward but it might still be, be behind us. Yeah, I have to think of whether that's actually possible. Um, and, and compare exchange, recent, you know, this we don't reread tail. It's, it's hidden inside of here. Recent gets updated with the most recent value of tail in the compare exchange if it fails. So we can loop around until we've given it the, the best guess at where tail is. Or, um, Sebastian Reddell, I miss Sebastian. Sebastian used to show up here every year. And every time I click a slide, not every time, because not all my slides had bugs in them, but every time I clicked a slide and had a bug, as soon as the slide showed up, I went to say something, his hand goes up. He's just instantaneous compiler. And he's just like, oh, that's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, that's uh, the most vexing part. See, that's not actually a const uh, constructor going on there. Like, oh, yeah. And then even lock free stuff. He's like, wait a second. I was going through this one time. He's like, hey, that, that can never happen. Uh, Tail, pause can never, tail can never be ahead of pause. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's 20 slides from now. So one time I was giving this talk, he said, why don't you just update tail? Just, you don't care if you're the most recent guy. You don't care if it's changed. You're like, I am probably the most recent guy. I just wrote this value. Just update tail. It, someone else might have said, actually got ahead of you and said tail was here, but the likelihood of that is probably low. And it's okay to mark tail as being behind, you just can't mark it forward. So this is relaxed, whereas this, even though in theory they are relaxed, they're not. This is a relaxed right, and it's just, it's simpler, right? It's just update tail. An example of like the algorithm will go back and just punch forward and maybe there's something that just needs yeah. to be Even what, no matter how we update tail, it's behind. As mm -hmm. Soon as you update it, even if we got, yes, we're the last guy to write, yes, we've updated tail. The next person who comes in, it's probably be behind again. It's always behind. You just assume it's always behind. So we can write it anywhere as long as it's behind. And, and then it's like, you know, we need the formal proof of, is it always behind? Some of that can be um, <coughs> the fact that pause always goes forward. Um, you know, we never decrement pause, so we never go backwards. <coughs> uh, but so does that imply that you really do need to release when you write into it so it doesn't get 
out of order with your right? Uh, out of order with the right into here. Yeah, so that means you really do need to go to this one out of all eight. Yeah. What do you do with the four? Right, so if we were to write uh, here, and then we move tailish to there, or well, say we're right here, we move tailish to there, but that right hasn't actually happened yet because it's out of order, right. then yeah, we've moved tail too far. You and Sebastian, thank you. Um, yes, that's the reason why we need to put a release on, we need to put an acquire release on our right. Because after has to happen after, right? right. We need a, we actually need a require. Even though we're writing, we need an acquire. This is why you don't just take my code, cut and paste it in, and expect it to work. That's why we need provability. Um, so, pop. What's pop look like? Surprisingly, what you do to, to write pop is you take push and you paste that in. And then you re mostly replace tail with head. Um, you've got a slight difference up here where you know there was a val that came in, and instead this time we're going out, so we need an entry to start with. And we're actually going to this time pass entry into the find uh, to, to so when we do the find is when we're going to read the entry. And then when we try, I thought this was going to be try read value, but it's actually try remove value because we have to remove it and leave a zero there. And we're going to use the entry that we've already read to make sure it hasn't, you know, is it the same entry that we thought it should be? Uh, and we're, we'll probably get to do the same thing here. And so find head looks a lot like find tail. We just replace the words. <laughs> we pass this, this entry in because we're going to need it later. And we have to, here's where we read the entry. Um, I claim relax is okay there. I have to think about what Stephen was saying, but relax is okay there. And then maybe tail, uh, we need to do the maybe head, which is, you know, switch, switch these things, which is if I use the question mark operator, I only have one thing to switch, but. Um, and whenever uh, you're writing any kind of queue and head and tail become symmetrical, I think you've probably done something right. So, and you know, it's like, uh, you know, proof by similarity. Is that, is that, is that a valid proof? Yeah. It's a fragrance, not a smell, a fragrance. Uh, and try remove. Uh, we can, we have our old entry because we've already read it once in the find. And we know what we want to write is uh, the same generation with a, with a zero. Actually, that's wrong. We, we want to write the next gen. The, is that right? We put, we, yeah, it's, this is supposed to be the next generation, right? Because you, we've moved, we've moved up. Plus one type type. Um, and here I'm also going to put a barrier on that and possibly the same thing. Maybe I need to acquire a release there. Um, but for the external user, I definitely need an acquire. I'm going to acquire this, this data. Oh, yeah. I, I are <laughs> I've already been considering whether I need to acquire a release on that because I'm acquiring data for, for the end user, but for my sake, I am writing data for my internal uh, accounting, and therefore I need a release on my, on my data. Missed it on the other one. Exercise for the reader. Uh, and the other exercise for the reader, same way, is right now we're looping on empty forever. Um, we don't want to do that. So either return zero or wait for non-empty. And in this case, remember, zero wasn't a valid uh, value, so we could just return zero. So uh, this is all the code. It all fits on a slide. <laughs> I'm, I'm too far away from my. Um, 
So all you have to do is look at this code and think about all the states at the same time. And then you can prove that everything works. That this is how you do lock free programming. <coughs> so now, <laughs> how, much, what, how much is there the timer guy here? Someone who's, oh, that's, this is time left or time gone? It's, this almost, it's 45, so it's like the same. <laughs> 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 you said it's time left. All right, okay, perfect. Uh, choose your own adventure. Uh, you know, that, remember that series of books? Or, um, does anyone know uh, Dinosaur Comics, uh, web comic, by a guy named Ryan North? He also wrote a Choose Your Own Adventure, Romeo and Juliet, except for he's not allowed to call it Choose Your Own Adventure because that's like trademarked. So it's a choosable path adventure. <laughs> Um, he also did Hamlet, you know, to be or not to be, so <laughs> there's... <laughs> uh, so, choose your own adventure. Yes, I can just use the trademark term. Uh, what do we want to do next to this queue? So all of that up to now was warm up, get your brain thinking of lock free. Would we like to make head and tail completely disappear? Make it even more relaxed than it already is. Just make it go away. Um, would we like to store non-integers? Uh, as I mentioned, we could, we could try to make the weight and uh, the full and empty. We could try growing the crew, the queue. Uh, we could do some proofs, or does someone have another idea of what we'd like to do to this queue? Yes? So the question, what happens if your generation count is over? Ah, yes. We could solve that problem. What happens when the generation count overflows? Yeah. I mean, right now it's an int, because I like using ints for numbers. Um, but this is one case where I'd actually use an unsigned so that at least overflow would be uh, defined behavior. But we still have the problem of overflow and then you have like my, um, my generation less than generation is going to be wrong when you, when you wrap around. And, and another one that the count thread takes so long that the generation run, runs around. Yes. So the, the, the worrisome case is, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be really rare that the generation count actually wraps around uh, an unsigned int, right? So not only have you put four billion things into the queue, it's not just you've put four billion things in the queue, you've wrapped the queue four billion times. Whatever size the queue is, you know, it's 64 items or something you have gone 64 times 4 billion items into, the, into and out of the queue while this other thread was just trying to push something or just trying to pop something. So um, if you're worried about that, uh, go on a machine that has 64 bit, you know, and then it's like now you're talking literally lifetime of universe kind of time scales, right? Or hundreds of years or whatever. Um, how long does it take to, for a computer to, to count to 4 billion? Say on a 4 gigahertz machine. One second, right, you know, four gigahertz, right? Um, how long does it take it to, to count to 62 to the 64? You know, that's 130 years, right? That's, we're, we're now on to the um, Unix time, when Unix time will overflow kind of thing. Um, and, and if you were like, how many seconds into, the, if two to, the, two to the 64 seconds, does anyone know how long that is? That's 42 times the, the uh, life of the universe. So that's why 42 is the magic number, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, well, well, you know, and for the next quite while, it'll still be pretty much accurate. <laughs> it's going to be accurate for quite a while now. Um, so yeah, we have this problem of our generation count can overflow. And, and we could try to solve that. We, we add that there. Would you like to solve that problem? No. Which problem would you like to solve? Storing ints, more than anyone else? Wait on full. Wait on full. Okay, here's, here's uh, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six things and five fingers, but we're programmers, so zero. Zero is the first one. So think now, N and this one is uh, the uh, unsigned int overflow. You have to raise your hand with which one you would like. One, zero to five. Okay. On the count of three, one, two, five. I mean three. <laughs> okay. This is great because none of you will count and I can just pick whichever one I want. <laughs> <laughs> I see a lot of twos. I'll have to admit that. Uh, and okay. And I see some ones. So 
I'm going to do number one first because I think it's really cool. And because it's the one I started. So I need to get this onto the other. <laughs> first, I need to go to there. Let's just stop that for a second. Where is the, oh, there it is. It's the other way. Okay. There's my uh, queue. And I'm going to, I can't see it over here. I have to type here, but look there. There's my queue. How do we get rid of head and tail? This? Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome. So then we do this. We add some structs called head and tail and we return them. And then as a user, you don't push to the queue, you push to tail. So whenever you have a queue, you first get its tail and then you push. And so this is all based on the fact that everything we did with, with head and tail was relaxed and doesn't really matter such that it's always a hint. So why not just keep that hint local to your thread? So once you've got some tail where the last place you were, just start from there. You don't care where everyone else is. Just start from where you left off. And now head and tail, there's no contention. You're, you're not sharing data anymore. You're not sharing head ish and tail ish. You have your own copy of it. But you're sharing the queue much more. How much more? Every thread has to has to now look. Yeah, which means your handle and everything is also in there. Okay. Yeah. So um, we should put should have put that on the list of things to solve. How to get rid of false sharing within the queue. I can solve that one. The one way I want to solve that quickly is uh, don't put it, the next item in the next slot. Do it in a like uh, uh, you know co prime slot like always go up by fives or something so that and assume your queue is a power of two or something and then you'll just have each one make it just equal by two and yeah you can pad but then you've wasted space yeah, but then you can store more information there well it's a, yeah co prime is nice co prime bigger than the co prime bigger than the second one right yeah. yeah so there's some number that you can say i'm i'm going to skip over these entries and go to this is the next entry and when you wrap around, the next time you'll fill in those ones you skipped over and then fill in those other ones you skipped over. Now, that means you're um, loading more, you know, you're going across memory more, but you're getting less false sharing. So someone needs to, someday someone should write this, not on slides. <laughs> and actually, I had, a, I had a guy working for me um, that, that, and I was kind of his, we don't even have managers so much as his coach or whatever. I forget what we call it, but like I'm his, you know, mentor thing. And and one day he said he wanted to learn lock-free programming. He had no idea I'd, I'd ever talk about it because I don't talk about it at work. And I was like, oh, I know something about that. And then it dawned on me, I can get him to actually write this queue, <laughs> write all the tests, write all the all the uh, performance metrics. And this will be awesome. And then and then, uh, damn you, Google. Uh, <laughs> I won't even blame Google. It's his wife. His wife moved to want, you know, got a job in Silicon Valley. So they both left uh, Waterloo and moved to Silicon Valley, and he got a job at Google. So I, I, I told him actually, if he needed help, I would try to get him a job at Adobe or Google or all these places I know. But he didn't need my help. Um, not that I could actually help get you into Google. So uh, maybe Adobe. Um, Anyhow, uh, that was it. That I'm so far off now. Off. So the only question about this then is, uh, how does this work? Where starting from scratch, how do you find the tail, right? And and this this is where I get to walk well, over the whiteboard, the chalkboard. Um, you know, we've got our and and so we're looking for this, and this might be four because this is always my favorite numbers. And we're going to just start here at zero. So we're going to go like five times or four or five times around before we get to, to the right tail. 
So that's bad, right? But, but if we're starting from scratch, we've already got a clue that, well, there's a five in there, and we can go look at the other end and see that there's a four or there's an X or whatever. You can, you, you, there's only ever, the indices are only, or the generation count's only ever off by one. So you know it's between five and four. And so you can start at five, and also you can just binary search for the tail, right? As in, so that's why that maybe tail isn't quite the same, because you have to be a little more careful because you're not going in order, but you can jump to here, and if you see data of generation four, you know whether to look left or right to, to find the tail. I'm not sure binary search. Is you can't just say binary search, <laughs> because I'm it, not sure lower bound works on this, because you don't satisfy the precondition, because your data is changing while yes, you're yes. doing well, it. Yes, yes. I mean, and, and also, <laughs> what, what is the right algorithm? If you could use a standard algorithm, we need, this is our Sean Parent moment. This is the, the thing this week, is everyone has their Sean Parent moments. Um, what's our Sean Parent moment here? What is the right algorithm? If the data wasn't changing, what algorithm do we want to use? It's not actually binary search. No, it's, it's, it's up and down. Yeah. Partition point. Fine. <laughs> Rotate. Rotate's always the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the it's the same. Same, same. Absolutely. Right? Partition point, though, partitions. It's where is right. this stuff is the, the one side and that's on the other side. Tail is there. Whatever. That's it. That's all, you know. I think that is enough of a sketch to say, yeah, we can't just call partition point because it assumes it doesn't assume the data is changing. I think you probably could call partition point and it would just work, just the way the algorithm works. Um, it'll work or, or it'll come to an answer saying, um, it doesn't quite work, but it'll, it'll let's, let's just leave that. So we just want a good enough one, right? Yeah, we could exactly. Maybe. Median. Median of medians, yeah. Uh, there's so many ways to get a close number. At least, you know, divide and conquer to get to get the close number. So you're, saying, you're saying like you put the first entry, figure out your entry, whatever the last entry, but by the time you get the last entry, you gotta look at first entry. Yeah, well but by the time you look at the la last entry, if it's a five or a six or something, you know yeah. yeah. Like you don't necessarily you don't necessarily have to start over, because because it's it, all everything you do is a hint, right? You might be right. You might. Well, it might be six, though. So if you look at the left side, it's five. You look at the right. If it, if it's six, then you know that. If you, when you look at the right, if it's also five, then you have to look at the left again because it might be six, right? Yep. But yes. That, by that point, you're only one generation off. You're only one generation off, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's not enough to look at the first element and see if it's a zero, then just tail it. And if not, just take four zeros and just tail it that way. Yeah, well that's that's the other thing is is you can you you can look at the at the zeros. Um, and and it's the same thing. If you find a zero, if you just start and you find a zero, then you know it's this way. It's either it's you know zero. It's either here or it's over here, and if you find data, you know it's that way, okay. right? But again, if you find five zero, then you will take four zero or so. Yeah, and you're close. Yeah. You might, but if you find five zero, you can also just start backing up, right? I think there's many ways to to find the tail uh, and not have to be linear or not quite linear. Um, but now you guys wanted to do uh, non-integers. And I have no slides for that, so let's go back to... What's the first time you're zero? What's that? What's the first time you're zero? So two is in the position variable, right? Oh. You need more information. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's what the thing is. This is this is you like you don't have to wait for a condition variable. You just register an interrupt for a right to a specific location. Yeah. <laughs> 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 on a break point. Um there was a lot of twos. There was a lot of ones. Hmm. Zero was one of zero. <laughs> there was at least one zero. That was that was mine. <laughs> 
Okay, okay. This, this is the this is the committee way. Who wants who wants this one? Is this a five way poll? Or nope. Just <laughs> okay, who wants this one? All right, this one wins. Um, I've actually uh, done this one before, uh, and you know I could just pull up some slides, um, but uh, and this, this one's a little harder on, on chalkboard. So maybe that's not the. So we want to fill this in. Um, to do a convar, uh, you <coughs> normally get a lock, blah, 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 and then you, um, like on notify, not on notify, on the convar dot wait, you pass in the lock, right? Predicate. Um, but we don't want to be grabbing this lock. Uh, say if we're pushing, we don't want to grab the lock to see if it's if it's uh, waiting for it to be to have space available. Um, so what we need in all of this is another uh, atomic variable, which I can't remember what I called it last time. But uh, you know, uh, we need to keep track of waiters. Is there anyone waiting? And this is atomic. And uh, you might need uh, the read waiters and the write waiters, whatever. So whenever you come in here and you find full, you increment the waiter count, say, hey, I'm waiting, and you know, put the right uh, memory order on it. Uh, and then you can grab the lock and you can wait. And uh, if that was full. So readers, when they successfully uh, pull things out, uh, they should check the wait count and say, oh, somebody is waiting. Now I will do the convar notify. Uh, you can, yes, that is the trick to this. How to not miss the notify. Um, Because this guy over here did waiters plus plus, invented the lock and then did notify, and then did this, right? This was the tricky part. <laughs> now, how, okay, well, you know, this isn't supposed to be for me to solve. How do we solve this? <laughs> well, well, no, yeah, put a, put a lock on waiters, but. We, we could do this inside the lock. That doesn't help the other side who still wants to look at it outside the lock, but it's atomic, so they can do that. But they have to take the lock. Um, so we set waiters first, right? We say, hey, I am waiting. I, I'm about to be waiting, yes. We should name this, you know, about to be <laughs> waiting. Naming is important. Come, come to my talk tomorrow morning. Um, but you flag it as I'm, I'm going to be waiting. The guy who uh, checks that, he's going to grab the lock to before he does his notify. So if you do the waiting inside the lock, he checks waiting outside his lock, then he grabs the lock before he does his notify. Does that, does that make sense? If there's a waiter, lock. Yes? Wait, and then in, in here we're going to, you know, we release the lock temporarily, right? So we come in, <coughs> we, we got all the time in the world because we think the queue is full or empty or whatever thing we're waiting on, right? So we're, we're fine with taking a lock now, we've 
We've dropped off the lock free world. If we grab a lock, we increment this, and then we might be here. That means again we need to notify. No, there's no notify yet. Yeah. You you we're, we're, the non existent notify. We're just right here, right? So is it okay if there's an item in there? It doesn't have to be exactly empty or exactly full. That's not okay because you might not get another. Yes, you might, you might only have one. You've yeah. only got one. That you might have been the last one. Yeah, right. you, you thought uh, the queue was empty. One thing gets in there, and that's the last thing ever. Yeah. So we have, to, we have to see it. Okay, so uh, we increment, uh, we lock, we increment the weight count, and, and we haven't gone here yet. We're here somewhere. Right, so you're saying this guy is the, this is the guy who did the push, and in this case we're saying there's only one item in the queue. This guy has done a push, and... You need two waiters for You need something... I'm waiting. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'm about to wait. You take the lock. You're like, I'm now waiting. Yes. Then wait for some different variables. Right. And if those two are out of sync, whoever's pushing will know that you're still busy taking the lock and then asleep. Everyone heard that, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, so you you need two. You know, I'm about to wait, and I'm I'm really really about to wait. Uh, two separate things, which you could use the same atomic variable for and partition it or whatever. Um, and and how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay. Um, and can you? One person here can imagine it can work. Is that where we're at? That that to me is success. <laughs> All right. So it helps you with the lock problem, but it still doesn't help you with the previous misnotifying. Uh -huh. So, so I think, let's see. Once you have the lock in your condition variable test, you have to check whether there's something in the queue. Yeah. Whether, whether you can go. <coughs> like right here, you can check yourself. This thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that th that is part of it. The problem, I think, you, were you still want to don't want to miss the notify. Yeah, the, I think your point was but more that you can miss the notify between I'm about to wait and the like, because you figured out the queue is empty, and now you're like I'm about to wait, but the queue is no longer empty. Right. So. You need to, after I'm about to wait, you need to check whether the queue is empty again. You can do that inside the lock, yeah. You can do that inside the lock. And then you can see how many are left on this. This is, this is, this is my goal, <laughs> is that you all feel uneasy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, so, one, uh, part one of n or part two of n at cppcon i tackled this either i got it wrong um, and i did feel a little queasy about it but i did write this out so you can go look it up but this is a perfect segue into uh i do have more slides <laughs> um well first i mentioned this before i worried about auto i had all my code said this i don't usually use auto but it you know it's nice for slides because it keeps things short I'm not a I'm not a always a auto kind of guy, um, but and in this case uh, I did this and um, that makes pause an atomic when I don't need it to be an atomic because it was local, 
whereas in this case, it's not atomic. Um, alternatively, you can do dot load, and then you get it's not, a, it's not an atomic, right? Um, Herb sent me some slides before he gave one of his talks that did, had the exact same thing. So I said, Herb, almost always, oh, it doesn't work. And he didn't do this, he did this, because he, <laughs> he likes. But it's also, you know, I like the dot load to say, hey, by the way, this isn't a normal variable. This is, you know, I, I kind of would, I wouldn't have been sad if we forced you to always use dot load and dot store on atomics and not have ever done this. Because I think it's important to see where those bear, you know, th those are the markers in your code that I'm sharing data here, I'm sharing data here, I'm no longer local. It, it feels like you're going to less explicit or le like less constrained or whatever. Right. Yeah. So they, that's kind it, of it's a different, if it's a different case, tested, yeah, okay. it's, it's an unusual case here of like, yeah. it's just important. It's yeah. just really you want to, yeah. But yeah, for, well, you know, should that have been an explicit? Uh, I think it's hmm. a weird case because it's a case where you, normal, you normally want the conversion, but the default is you, is not to convert, it's just say auto. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's that, there's this problem here, but even before auto, when, when we first did atomics, mm -hmm. I didn't like this because this looks like a normal piece of code and it's not a normal piece of code. This is a very important part in, in your algorithm. It's the part where you're, you're doing something important. In, in a certain sense, it's, it's like a heavy comparison when, you, when it's going to co or a conversion. Yeah. When it's going to cost a lot. Yeah, th there's, a, there's an extra cost out. here. And mm -hmm. yeah, whenever you, well, that's, an, that's another one of, um, so somewhere online there is a paper by me of um, when to use explicit and implicit conversions. And uh, someday, hopefully, the committee will again discuss this. I'll bring uh, a revision of the paper. Um, and I mark, like, can it throw? Maybe you want explicit if it can throw. Can, you know, is it heavyweight? Do you want to make your conversion explicit? But then, like, you know, string copy to, another, to construct another string, well, that can throw, but you don't want a normal copy to be explicit so things to think about um, that's auto so here's the here's what this the point the point of this is fear certainty and doubt <laughs> um, <laughs> you should have fear with lock free programming and you should be full of doubt and you should be certain of it, there, there, it this it is not just fud where it's like oh it's not really scary no it's really scary um, and I mentioned, you know, remember this normal lock free code with uh, release means before means before and require means after uh, means after. Um, this is not quite correct. Maybe. So here's another example that is being discussed in committee, you know, this week. Uh, I've got some, and, and I've tried my best because the, you know, the example in the committee is, has no context at all. It's just like, here's some variables. And then you're like, why would anyone do this? So I'm trying to make up a pseudo example at least of why you might want to do this. You've got some non-atomic data, maybe a singleton or whatever, sadly, um, and you want to keep track of its initialized. So you init it, you init your non-atomic data, and then you mark it as initted, and the user does his acquire and says, oh yeah, great, it's been initted, I can use the data, and we get the proper uh, happens before relationship. And then someone, this is gonna take a while to build up to the problem, Someone else comes around and says, oh, I want to keep track of these atomic or these uh, singletons, or maybe they're like, maybe it's a, a Phoenix singleton that like gets constructed, destroyed, constructed, destroyed, whatever it is. For some reason, someone wants to keep track of these things. Maybe this is all inside a class and you create a bunch of these, but you still, um, so we just want to count them. We have some, maybe we want to log it, whatever. So we have another atomic bool, whether it's been counted or not. So. Uh, we set the data, we initialize the data, but we don't want to make this counting take up any time on an on, on important thread. So we have another thread that somewhere comes around and checks. I, if this has been initialized and it hasn't been counted yet, then we'll keep track of it. We'll just increment this, uh, this keep track thing. And then we'll mark it as counted. And this can probably be relaxed because for the same reason, it's just accounting. We don't, you know, nothing depends on the fact that we've counted it, right? Other than our own don't count it more than once, right? Why do we use the atomic authority if it's only used by step two? Yeah. 
Well, that's a good question. Well, let's just leave it there for the purposes of moving on with yes. your slides. Right? Well, <laughs> at this point, maybe it doesn't. But then what happened is someone else came around and um, said, let's take this code and we'll refactor it and we'll merge these two atomics. All right? So we have a state for our non-atomic data that is either unanitted or anitted or it's been counted or not, right? So um, init does the same thing and uh, accounting, you know, it's basically the same code. That's why I put them side by side and you can just in purple see the difference there. Now we check, is it been anitted yet? Update it to, so we've, we've gone from, in, in the, the committee emails, it's all about phases. It's like you, you st your object, your data started in phase one, it moved to phase two, it moved to phase three. So now let's take that code and put it over on this side of the thing. So we can go back to the user thread. The user thread used to check for initialized and now it's gonna check for, is the phase of the data knitted or beyond, right? And so we can see that we have, that happens before, we have the data has been set, that happened before it was knitted. Uh, counted state happened after knitted. Even though it's relaxed, atomics have a uh, consistent history. This happens after that. It, there's no other way. Because so you've got a load in here, right? Yeah, well, yeah, there's a load here. But that load is <laughs> well yeah. this load could be relaxed. This, the, that load has to be sequenced with that load down there because they kind of call the Well, th yeah, there, there's an if statement here. Yeah. So this is never going to happen. So there's, yeah. I, I don't even need like barriers for that. It's just the if exactly. statement forms a barrier. Yeah. Um, this could be relaxed, but I don't care. Even if this is sequential, consistent, I, you know, whatever. Um, so you can, you can draw... Um, you know, and I, I'm claiming this is all, all equi oh, well, you know, we could have used a bit field there as the other way to do that. You know, same idea, right? Yeah, yeah, we could have just checked for non-zero as well. Um, whichever. So we had, we claim we have this uh, relationship still. No, we don't. This is undefined behavior. <coughs> Where in the world does this become undefined behavior? And I'll mention probably undefined behavior <laughs> because the committee is arguing whether this is undefined or not. <coughs> so I'm going to look to the guy who does the distributed systems as to why this is undefined. So if you read the standard, it says this. There's a data race. That's the problem. And every data race is undefined, regardless of why it happened. Well, right? the standard so says. No, no, no. That's a race. You see, the, 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 the accounting thread. And you that's don't know which the, the state is still. If you, even though you've stored it relaxed, you haven't got a sequence point to, to yeah. read again. And that's defined as. A data race. Yeah, yeah, it's a race because they're not the same behavior. Right. So we're, we're, we're saying that here's where we failed because of this relax. Even though yeah. we know that it can't, we've got so a consistent history of it. It'll yeah. either be. Is, is the argument that the relax breaks the release acquire sequence? Yes. So the, the relax yeah. breaks the release acquire because the release acquire says that you see the value written by the release. Okay. We're not seeing that value. We're seeing a value that happened after it. Well, and, and you're like, it happened after. Well, if we see either, we just, we d we'll, we'll, yeah. I know it's, bo both are fine uh, because we weren't dumb and wrote the program in such a way that it's not dependent on which one happened. Or right. But it's a data race, which is undefined. Well, this, that's the question. Is it a data race? Is, when the standard says you have to see <coughs> the exact value that was written here, is that what it should say? That's the question. That's why it's probably. Well, if that's the case, then we, the, then the memory order is part and not part of the usage, and clearly it's part of the usage. Yeah, memory order is part of the, well, that could well, be. If well, if, the if, the you break, if you can break the release acquire sequence by using a relax <coughs> order anywhere, then the memory order should be part of the atomic type yeah, because yeah. you're supposed to use the same memory yeah. order everywhere. The, 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 way yeah, the way I think of this um, is um, 
So like I said before, before means before and after means after. And, and what we're basically saying is even though this happened after this, after that, or well, this was before this and this was before that, the, the before doesn't, doesn't carry because there's not a before between here and there, right? And the way, other way of thinking this is imagine this was a distributed system that when you write this non-atomic data and then you release it, it packages up all the data that's changed and sends it off to uh, every machine. And the, the other important part here is that this thread is not, the same, is not on the same CPU as that thread. So we pack up our data and we send it out to the world. This uh, distributed computer on, in Japan gets, oh, the data has changed, I'll update my accounting. And then I will tell the world that the state has changed, and he propagates that as well. This guy over here in Australia hasn't heard about the data change, but hears about the state has changed. And this guy didn't pack up. He packed up all the data that had changed in this thread. He didn't pack up this because he doesn't think it's changed. So he hasn't propagated all the changed data that you think goes along with this. Yeah. Well, he, he packs up the non-atomics. The atomics are packed up on their own, to a certain extent. Yeah, but if there were any non-atomics, they can't reach it. They collapse in some other yeah, yeah, and relax is like, I'm not packing up anything. I don't care what you did. So, I mean, when I first saw this, I was like, no, that's fine. And then I'm like, oh, wait a second. So, and, and half the SG-1 is arguing whether this, you know, are we comfortable with this? And so, that is my... Fear, certainty, and doubt. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really depends on what number of random you have on the uh, I, I mean, the, the solution is just put. Uh, on the, sorry, on the, yeah. Oh, memory order here? Yeah. E even if this is strong. Yeah, if it's partially consistent, then you have to form a global order. And I think I've written that both, all the systems have to agree. Yeah. They agree at this point, but the, I. Right. Um, it's partially consistent. This is exactly the distributed system problem you were talking about. So it thinks it's okay, whereas the answer wouldn't think it's okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's the point of sequential consistency is like everyone thinks it's the same. <coughs> um, right. So anyhow, point is to scare you. Um, this one is another one that to scare people, is when you read a pointer, uh, that's two separate loads, right? You load the, the pointer, and then you load what it's pointing at. Right? Obvious. Can those two things be reordered? It's like, how in the world can you read what it's pointing at before you read the pointer? Yet, on some machines, these can be reordered. It's really hard to think about how that happens. It's like you need to be running on like a power or deck alpha or things that have really, really relaxed memory orders. But basically, if... Uh, it might just... I thought Michael Wong mentioned some power machine, but um, I don't know. It's definitely deck alpha, and it's like no one uses that. So, but um, you know, I find it fundamentally scary even trying to imagine how this could happen. Um, but if you imagine that it previously has read this pointer before, and it like pulls it out of its, maybe it just wrote the pointer, so it pulls it out of its right queue and doesn't go all the way to to real memory or all these other crazy things. Um, and then this is my last uh, scary thing. And this has nothing to do with lock free, it's just threads. So uh, you can go, go online, look this up. Uh, the Berkeley people uh, wrote an OS as part of you know, this ex you know, things that universities do. And importantly, they one of the points of the project was to use uh, effective software engineering practice, design reviews, code review, nightly builds, regression tests, automated code coverage metrics for the core kernel and all the important threading bits, they got experts, concurrency experts, to review the code. 100% code coverage regression tests. No problems were observed in the code until it deadlocked four years later. <laughs> four years of running an OS before it deadlocked and found a bug. So, I mean, that's a whole nother talk of how do you test lock-free code? You test it, because that's important, but don't think that that means it's right. It means it's not as wrong as before you wrote your tests. 
Um, and that is the end of my talk. I just suddenly jumped to the end.